Good morning. We're here with Lieutenant General Stephen Quass, retired from the United States Air Force. Uh, General Quass had a remarkable career in the U.S. military, and we're going to delve into a little bit of your background today, General Quass. I had noted that you were an uh, aide to the Vice President of the United States, uh, that you have an extensive um, academic as well as professional career in looking at ideology, conflict, and how all of these things kind of play together. But today, with TechCrunch and what is going on with their conference, and this will be shown beyond the conference as well, it's about in-space servicing, in-space manufacturing, and the future of space. So I want to open up with the old kind of uh, saw and, uh, and talking about, I, I used to be a board game player, I'm not from the military, I'm from a military family, it, that armchair generals like to talk about battles and wars, and real generals like to talk about logistics, and General Eisenhower was a huge, huge proponent of that, and so Steve, I'd like to start out with that and your thoughts about logistics. Well, thank you very much, Dennis. I appreciate the opportunity. And you're exactly right. Uh, professionals talk about logistics, and here's why. Because ultimately, the job of a national security professional or a general officer is being a peacemaker. I know people like to talk about weapons and tactics, uh, and you know, uh, but ultimately, peace through strength is about preventing conflict. And the way you prevent conflict is by building up the prosperity of an economy. And the way you build up the prosperity of an economy is by having logistics in place so everyday people can make a living and get the right person, the right thing, to the right place at the right time for the right reason. And this is why logistics is the foundation of all prosperity and security across all borders. Yeah, uh, that, it's very, very interesting that you take the, eco the larger economic aspect uh, because I know, as you know, as also a historian, that the, the power, the beginnings of the great power of the British state began with their canals and went to the railroads. And here in the United States, we followed a similar path in the state, the nation, supporting the development of our railroad network. And then General Eisenhower, or even before, in 1926, one of his first jobs as a captain was to try to cross the United States in a car. And it was such a debacle that when he became president in 1956, he signed the Interstate and Defense Highway Act, which is the basis of our interstate highway system today. And so we want to expand that now in space into what we call the cislunar domain. And for those who don't know what cislunar means, we're talking about the space in low Earth orbit where the International Space Station and CubeSats and remote sensing satellites are today, and extending that beyond where we normally operate today, which is geosynchronous orbit, which is 23,700 miles or 33,000 kilometers in space to extend that to the moon and even beyond. So Steve, could you tell us a little bit of, of your thoughts and where you see the future going in the expansion of, let's call it our logistical footprint into cislunar space? You bet. And so when you study um, history of every civilization that we have recorded records on, what you see is those civilizations that are able to maintain peace uh, are the ones that build a strong economy and they do it by laying in the foundation of logistics. So let's talk about space. Um, space is really, uh, the, the logistics foundation has not been put in place yet. Uh, so imagine this, imagine America before any uh, industrialization or any economy where it was here. Uh, and you just had, you know, let's say horses around there. The satellites that are in space right now are like a bunch of horses just sitting around America somewhere. Um, and, and, but um, what, what you should look for are, are those companies that are talking like Eisenhower did. Hey, I want to build a road network so we can get vehicles more quickly with more weight at cheaper price points to any point on the planet. We want to build gas stations so that we can refuel them. We want to build trains and airports uh, so that there is commerce that can flow and it's affordable to everybody. This is what space has as its opportunity. 
that uh, as powerful as the American land is with the inter Eisenhower interstate system and our infrastructure of transportation, that is even uh, is more powerful when you take a look at the open oceans and what Teddy Roosevelt did in building the Panama Canal to cut the price and the time in half of getting to markets across the globe. Space is all of that on steroids. And the first civilization, the first companies that invest in the three pillars of logistics will not only be the first trillionaires on the planet, but they will be the ones that usher in uh, the, the security in space. And those three pillars, just to mention them, are the ability to maneuver to any place you need for any reason at any time, uh, the ability to bring energy to bear at those points, to energize any piece of equipment or uh, things that need to be used by human beings to do something meaningful. And then the third is communicate, where you can communicate to any place at any time quickly enough to be able to understand what's going on around you. These three pillars of logistics are really what you need to be keeping an eye on because the companies building them are going to change the fate of humanity. Indeed, and I want to show a graphic here uh, quickly, and it uh, shows up uh, on my screen here, and I'm going to uh, do a screen share for that. Uh, there we go, and let's see, I believe, which screen are you seeing shared right now? Oh, yeah, okay, there it is. Okay, so this graphic kind of shows move that moves back. I cannot see it on my screen, oh, so I just yeah. make sure you have it on the right one so the viewers can see it. All right, so let me get it there. Do you see it now? No? no. Well, this is uh, this, how our... Or have one more time. Just, you were just able to highlight your screen, so try it. Yeah, all right, here, so I'm going to, you know, this is the, the magic of the modern internet here, trying to figure out how to use our technology so we're going to share screen here and we're going to share this screen so this screen right here shows multiple uh, uh, le activities in space between here and the moon and you brought up something in your chat just a second ago that I want to emphasize is that in about three years ago I was asked to participate in a question that was put out by the joint staff of where we saw the future in space in the next 25 years and looking at logistics and, and where are the most critical points. And we identified what is called the libration points uh, at the Earth Moon uh, libration points, the lunar surface uh, in different areas in uh, cislunar space. And so could you talk a little bit about where you see things like cloud computing, what we're doing with UAVs, and then extending that because we're going to the moon. We're actually going to the moon, not this time for science, but for economics and for the beginnings of the economic development of the solar system. No, you're exactly right. So just like on the Earth, there are certain strategic points that are pivotal to the advantage of business and security, like the Panama Canal. Suez Canal, Straits of Malacca, uh, the high ground, if you're a soldier, uh, where you can see any approaching enemy. Uh, space has those same places and spots. It's a geography. Uh, and uh, and, and the, the ability to use the technologies we have, especially some of the automation that we can bring into uh, the cislunar economy, uh, allows you, you to perch on that strategic ground. Uh, and, and you can do it at price points far lower than what it took on the, the terrestrial level. So one satellite well placed at the, at the point that is the center of gravity between the moon and the earth, for example, could allow you to maneuver uh, just about anywhere in cislunar economy with almost no energy because you just tap it in the right direction with very little velocity and you can be there um, in a timely manner. So um, the, the ability to communicate, uh, the, ability, the fact that space is the perfect place for big data and for communication because whether it's laser comm or other forms of communication, space uh, has fewer impediments than you have on the earth where you have to have like 600,000 cell towers in America and even then 
you have no bars when you you know drive through the desert or into a valley in space you don't have to deal with those kind of problems uh, because of the way the geography is placed and as long as you go to those geographic center points that are the key to understanding and, and maneuvering and communicating and bringing energy to bear for the energizing of devices and equipment in space you can start this journey and you don't have to pe put people at risk uh, and our automation and artificial intelligence capabilities, our UAVs, if you will, unmanned aerial vehicles, and then the space vehicles, um, can do so much of this work. It's setting the foundation for the logistics of cislunar space. Great. And, and building on that will cause for national security to be served, and this is a theme here, is that we must have a strong economic basis. And one of the issues that we have had, and I know you faced this a lot when you were in the services, is that when applications and hardware is focused only on the national security, let's call it market, uh, it, it, it becomes an extremely expensive and time consuming uh, proposition. And we all like to bash what uh, Robert McNamara did and constraining the national security enterprise in space, but at the same time, unless there is economic growth where you have the wider economy and people out there doing things, what do you see are economic activities that the commercial realm could be interested in that also serve the national security market? Right, so this is exactly right. And I, I was blessed to be able to live through my service as a general officer, through that point where the military could no longer just invent things on their own and be the leaders like they did in inventing the internet through ARPA and then DARPA. Um, that the, uh, the, the internet and the connectivity of people around the world has made it forever changed, that now it will be commercial, that is more rapidly innovating. Uh, than a military ever could. The military will always be a little more plodding and slow because of the nature of its purpose. So what we need to look for in this new digital age, this network age we live in, is we have to look to the commercial sector uh, to build those business cases that then will uplift the military. This has always been the case, though. The military is only strong when the economy is strong. So this is the hard change in the mindset of general officers in the military right now is to let go of this illusion that they can uh, uh, be a business that can reinvent something. They need to look to these companies and what the, co the companies they need to look for are the companies that can build propulsion capability that can maneuver fast and cheap, communication capability that can uh, communicate ubiquitously in cislunar space, and those that can bring energy to bear uh, across space. These are the things that we look to and it's the commercial sector that will save us and make the military strong. Well, and, and that's an incredible point. And, and as someone who studies history myself, if you look at the Roman roads, everyone, you know, praises the Roman roads, but the Roman roads, 90% of the traffic, 95% of the traffic, even on Roman roads were commerce. And I call them a type one industrial civilization because we have industry. We had uh, the mass distribution of goods. It's just, it was pre, let's call it high energy. So energy, communications, manufacturing, commerce, all of these things are essential. And so what I would like to do now is kind of look forward 10 years in your most optimistic views looking at the impending hopeful operation of Starship. How is Starship going to change the future? And where do you see, let's call it our optimistic scenario, 10 to 20 years from now? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, so I, I started this by talking about the three pillars. It's the foundation of logistics, and that's the ability to transport, the ability to communicate, and the ability to bring energy to bear. I want to talk about the fourth one that will come after those are laid in and somewhat concurrently, and that's manufacturing. And this is where the Starship comes in. 
most people need to realize that they think about space as you build it on the planet Earth and then you lift it out of the gravity well, which is very expensive and actually you know, uh, requires great ruggedness because there's vibration and G-forces and all those things. But that is not the concept here at all. Manufacturing in space, most people uh, have a hard time wrapping their brain about that, but think about this. Um, it's as if there was a, a land the size of three African continents sitting within three days to travel of us right now. Yeah. And, and, and the ability to take all of the stuff the universe made the Earth of and, and that, are, that exist in all the asteroids and, and the moon, uh, that these three continents of Africa are sitting there waiting for somebody to benefit from the minerals and the uh, capability to build. So building a cislunar economy is about the word building and that's manufacturing. And there's no reason with our automation and our unmanned space vehicles, there's no reason that the robotics that we have cannot use telecommunication like 5G to be able to do things in space that build just like we build on Earth. And now, not only do you have zero gravity where you are not having to fight against one G that causes the structures at the molecular level uh, to be imperfect, you now have the ability to manufacture things cheaper and faster and then transport them because you are in cislunar space. You can transport them without the friction of the sea, the land, or the air that costs so much fuel. So now think about that. Now you can build and transport for pennies on the dollar the way you can, you know you would on Earth, and the, again the civilization that taps into this reality that you can build it and you can take it to the point of need faster and cheaper than you could ever do on planet Earth, they will be the trillionaires that rule the future, and we want those to be peace-loving people that value the respect of hard work and the rights of companies that put in the risk and that get the rewards. Steve, thanks so much for that. And, and what I would like to close with, and again, I want to go a little bit on the philosophical side uh, because that's part of your background as well, is that many of us who have been space advocates long before our hair was gray uh, in our student time, we've been pushing this for a very long time. A after the what we call the death of the Apollo program, people like Gerard K. O'Neill, uh, Dr. Von Braun and many were trying to educate people about space, but there are many out there today that would say, you know, this is all a fantasy. We need to take care of the earth. Uh, you know, uh, that stuff's not going to happen in time. We're, you know, there's just so many from the standpoint that, you know, we need it to focus on, uh, on earth. And I kind of call this the Zing He mindset which was, you know, the, the Chinese admiral who was, uh, uh, his work was destroyed by, that time, the Chinese emperors. Could you give us a little historical, uh, let's call it comparison contrast, that we don't want our current civilization to have its Xinhi moment to collapse upon itself, looking inward, and, and how do you see that inward versus the outward look? Right, so this is a great question and uh, I'll use the Starship and Elon Musk uh, as the beginning of this answer because you mentioned him earlier and, and I just have to uh, help people understand that he is one of those innovators that has done something that people said was impossible even 10 years ago, yeah. uh, even less than that. Um, and so the power of the human mind to create uh, things that are useful uh, is just unfathomable and, and that Starship is going to be the thing that takes into space those robotics and those capabilities that then start building in space, for space, that transform. But the reason why civilizations in the past have imploded because they turned inward instead of outward, uh, as you described, is because of human nature. And human nature, uh, if it can't see something, it doesn't believe it. And this is so powerful, we don't even realize how blind we are to what is in the art of the possible. And I'll use one story that hits home for Americans. If you uh, go back into the archives and you take a look at the front page of the New York Times on October 9th, 1903, um, it's when Congress was getting sick and tired of giving so many millions of dollars to Samuel B. Langley to try to build an airplane, and he kept failing. They kept crashing into the Potomac River. 
Um, so they finally had the scientists and the engineers of the day, the most <laughs> brilliant and respected minds of 1903. And they did a study because the question was, are we wasting our money by throwing it after a dream that'll never come true? Or is this something that we're on the verge of? And those scientists came back with a study and the front page of the New York Times said, even if we uh, spent all the money we have with every genius we have, it would take between 1 million and 10 million years to invent an aircraft. That was the stated advice of the most brilliant minds of the time. That very same day, October 9th, 1903, if you look in the logbook of Orville and Wilbur Wright, it only has four simple words. We begin building today. And two and a half months later, they flew a controlled manned aircraft at Kitty Hawk Kildall Hill. That is how powerful Elon Musk is the Wright brother of our age. And he is proving to us and showing to us, not by saying, but by doing. And the civilizations that don't recognize this blind spot of human nature within ourselves are the ones that crash and burn. Just like China did in the 1400, the Ming Dynasty, they uh, the one they had two parties, and this is very comes home to America too today. They had two parties that hated each other. They were polarized. Okay, the one party in power said, "We're going to build a, 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 a fleet of ships that will take us to the marketplaces across the globe." And they started building it. It was the greatest fleet ever. They would have been the England of 1400, ruling the world economy. But guess what? They lost power, and the next party came into power, and they hated the other party so much that they burned all the ships to the ground. And the Chinese attribute this long degradation into the century of humiliation, where the opium wars and their society was almost on the verge of collapse. They attribute it back to that decision. So America has a choice right now. We either recognize the power of space to transform the economy of the globe and uplift the human condition, or we turn inward and avoid it like the Chinese did, and we will find ourselves without security or freedom or an economy that can defend our values. That is as stark as the choice is. As a national security professional and a historian, I will tell you that that is the choice America has. We either embrace space and those companies that are doing these things to build the logistics of space for the future of the human race and the prosperity of this planet. And believe me, all of our problems with food, water, pollution can be solved using space as a resource. We can turn to the skies, as Jeff Bezos has said before. We can turn to the universe for our resources and planet Earth can be the park yeah. that we never have to scar or pillage for our resources. That's what we have in front of us if we pay attention. Steve, I absolutely could not say that any better. Thank you so very kindly for doing this. We're gonna put this up at TechCrunch today, but we also, with your permission, will have it on YouTube because I think what you have just closed with is the uh, existential, yeah, I can't say the word correctly, but it is the probably the greatest conflict and the greatest choice we have before us, the future in faith or the past in fear. So thank you so very kindly today, uh, General Kloss, for joining us. God bless, and we wish you the best for the future. Well, you as well, and uh, enjoy this beautiful season of celebration. Indeed. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.